And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Day's here with Todd Erzin, whose camera apparently doesn't it's work. turned off right now. Apparently, you know what it is. It is... No, I screwed up. Did you hit the wrong button? I, no, I... There, there he is. I, I thought it was the guy literally brought in vinegar to drink during the show. I said we need to be able to drink on set, and I'm just moving the bar slowly. We're starting with vinegar, and we'll see where this goes. <laughs> All right. Maybe that the camera was like, America cannot see that. Aaron McIntyre is, is, is here as well. It is war between Aaron and I here today, each uh, representing as uh, the NFL season kicks off tonight. And the Lions get the coveted spot of the first game of the year to be sacrificial i'm sorry the uh the opponent for the super bowl champions it'll be a good game are you you really gonna lou holtz this thing right out of the gate i'm ready to be hurt again i'm I'm ready to be hurt again i'm very excited it's my 40th year as a detroit lions fan we have one playoff win since 1957 which is a year before my mother was born by the way December 30th, 1957 was uh, was the last time the Lions won a playoff game. Uh, actually won the NFL championship. I know my mom was actually born about a month later in January of 1958. So that's the last time the Lions, or that's the, they only have one playoff win since then. That was my senior year in high school. We have the longest ongoing division title drought. So like, don't send me your stuff like, oh, we haven't done anything with it. No, none of you are sending it right now. None of you have suffered like this. Those of us who wear the Honolulu blue and silver have suffered. This is the this is arguably the worst franchise in American team sport. And so to get all the hype that we are getting right now is a little bit scary. So I'm ready to be hurt again. I'm ready. Probably deserve it. What did I do to deserve it? I don't know, something, the, the yin and the yang, maybe Michigan, your, your insufferable Wolverine fandom, you know, it all has to balance okay. out. Okay, all right, that's fair. Free that's Harbaugh. Fair. <laughs> yeah, there, thank you. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> Tough, but fair. All right. Oh, all yeah, right. deserve it in a sports world context. I don't want to be too yeah, I know. Yes. I, I know what you meant. Yeah, I, I know you weren't going, uh, Rabbi, who sinned yeah. so that this man was born blind? <laughs> I, I understood the context. I got it. <laughs> well, you, you were okay. like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> folks, right now our values are under attack everywhere we turn. That includes in many of America's workplaces where if you are a patriot, you're made to attend woke DIA, DEI trainings or support pagan causes you don't want to believe in or be a part of and that's why you want to go to redballoon.work they are fighting back they're america's largest woke free job board every week tens of thousands of job seekers visit red balloon looking for a new career without all the woke nonsense when you visit redballoon.work use promo code steve to receive five free profile search credits that's a 50 dollars value at redballoon.work promo code steve All right, coming up on today's show, we'll go back to front, three non-political questions. Theology Thursday, we are wrapping up, we're winding down the series we've been doing on Dr. Tony Evans' book, Kingdom Politics. Um, At the bottom of this hour, whistleblower Steve Friend will join us. Look forward to that conversation. But until then, here is Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Dialing It Up. The DeSantis campaign unleashed this ad yesterday, touting the governor's leadership through COVID. The world lost its mind when common sense suddenly became an uncommon virtue. Indoor and outdoor venues should be closed. You know what our biggest enemy is in America? Our fellow Americans. Now is the time to do what you're told (laughs) you got to do something draconian florida was a refuge of sanity mandates lockdowns fines we're just not doing that they are not effective let me tell you that right now i don't think government has a right to put these people out of work if the rest of the country had done everything that ron DeSantis said and did in florida we'd be in a much better place as your president i will never let the deep state bureaucrats lock you down. You don't take somebody like Fauci and coddle him. You bring Fauci in, you sit him down, and you say, Anthony, you are fired. 
In addition to that ad, DeSantis went on Dave Rubin's show and had words for Donald Trump. So it's obviously bogus. I mean, half the country visited Florida over COVID. And you're trying to say California, New York, and Illinois uh, handled it better? Uh, Give me a break. Like, the more he does that, uh, I think it helps me because I kind of wish, like, he had broader reach with some of his social media because I think just putting that stuff out there, I think it hurts his credibility and especially because his entire family moved to Florida under my governorship. This morning, DeSantis doubled down. For months, you know, May of 2020, summer of 2020, fall of 2020, you know, even January of 2021, you know, I was getting uh, hit by the, the White House task force under Trump. Not This wasn't even Biden. This was Trump. They were sending us missives to Florida saying impose a mask mandate and close bars and restaurants uh, and businesses. And that's what they were pushing. Meanwhile, Trump was interviewed by Hugh Hewitt yesterday and claimed yet again he was unable to fire Anthony Fauci. The biggest knock on your presidency is you kept Dr. Fauci. Why did you keep Dr. Fauci? No, no, no. Dr. Fauci was there. First of all, you're not allowed. He's civil service and you're not allowed to fire him. But I forget that because I don't, you know, I don't necessarily go by everything. But Dr. Fauci would tell me things and I wouldn't do them in many cases. In Colorado, voters there are suing on 14th Amendment grounds to take Trump off the primary ballot in that state. They say he engaged in sedition and is therefore not suited to hold office. In Texas, a Reagan-appointed federal judge, yes, there are still some of those around, has ordered the Texas state government to remove and move the barriers it placed in the Rio Grande to the riverbank on the Texas side of the river. The state was also ordered not to put up any additional structures on the river until the final outcome of the lawsuit filed by the Department of Justice to remove those barriers. Texas says it'll appeal this most recent ruling. In New York City, Mayor Eric Adams says illegal immigration is going to destroy his city. We're getting no support on this national crisis, and we're receiving no support. And let me tell you something, New Yorkers. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. Destroy New York City. Hats off to Georgia's state attorney general, who's using the same RICO statute just used against Donald Trump and some of his supporters to indict 61 Antifa types in and around Atlanta on charges they conspired to commit violence and other criminal activity in order to stop the building of a police training facility in Atlanta. And now is the part of the montage where the quaaludes kick in. First of all, let me say that our president has been an extraordinary leader. A substantial amount of time we spend together is in the Oval Office where I see how his ability to understand issues and weave through complex issues in a way that no one else can to make smart and important decisions. And finally, this. Oh, my apologies. Mandates are about to be reinstated, so I was wearing my mask to get ahead of the curve. I love my mask, especially in an election year, because it's a simple yet effective way to display my allegiance to the regime. Am I concerned that an analysis of top scientific studies was conducted this year and concluded that mask mandates did nothing to stop the spread of COVID-19? Nope. Am I concerned that mandatory masks once led to mandatory vaccines, which led to an epidemic of heart conditions in the otherwise young and healthy? No. Am I concerned that COVID stimulus checks and manufacturing manufactured supply shortages have created a steep loss in purchasing power, making it next to impossible to afford basic necessities? Not even a little bit. Am I concerned that this state of hyperinflation will eventually lead to the perceived need for a government-backed universal basic income that will enslave us to the state in inconceivable ways? Not until it affects me directly. And why am I not concerned, you ask? I'm not concerned because I decided a long time ago that sticking to a bad course of action is much easier than admitting I was wrong. And lastly, I prefer to put on my mask, and one day when my children ask, I'll tell them I washed my hands clean, not of COVID-19, but of any and all culpability for handing the world over to commies. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage, fitting timing, brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. They came on board the show post lockdowns uh, because they were concerned when suddenly venerable, provable successful medications like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin are suddenly labeled as um, rat poison, horse paste, 
You're literally taking your life into your own hands. I don't know, it may not work, may not help you avoid the cytokine storm of a pulmonary infection because of um, an infection from COVID. May not do that, but they're certainly not dangerous. And so suddenly now award-winning medications were nowhere to be found. And so they wanted to make sure you had access to the next round of venerable, provable, successful antibiotics like amoxicillin, like doxycycline, should they also, when we need them the most, be suddenly determined to be dangerous. Now they want to make sure, and make sure you do get the Jace case if you haven't already, but now they want to make sure that you backed up your existing medications just in case your meds might be the next ones we have to no longer use. Um, And that's where we get to jacemedical.com promo code DACE whether it's heart medication diabetes cholesterol even mental health and more back up your existing medications take control of your own health as much as you can do not trust the system um, and avoid trusting having to trust it as often as you can Jace Medical J-A-S-E jacemedical.com use the code DACE at checkout for Jace for a discount jacemedical.com code DACE at checkout for a discount. In the overtime today, we are going to be discussing what what has happened to Tucker Carlson. What, what, what are we doing here? What, what, what is happening here? I mean, I mean, you know, um, here's a guy that may have gnawed on Barack Obama's manhood in, in the 20th century. What, what, what? What is this? Like six months ago, this was the most important voice in America. What, what is happening here? What is this? We will discuss the answer to that question. Now that we hope Tucker has hit, shall we say, bottom. We will discuss that today in the overtime. Glad I brought my vinegar today. <laughs> Maybe. Gonna need it. <laughs> The whole thing is just, <laughs> what are we doing? Ah. BlazeTV.com slash Dace. That's BlazeTV.com slash Dace. That's where you can go to watch today's overtime and not miss any of the exclusive content we do for you on Blaze TV. Just 10 bucks a month. BlazeTV.com slash Dace. So yesterday we talked about, with via Tudor Dixon, we got a glimpse into a political model that we could have been utilizing this entire time, okay? When I say that, and I've said this many times, that the left was successful because it used leverage-based politics and the right was successful because it used access-based politics, understand, again, I'm not saying access-based politics is immoral. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is if you are using it for everything other than getting leverage, it will be ineffective, and you'll you'll even you'll go you'll and you'll end up anywhere from feckless to cowardly to a grifter. How much of the right does do those three terms d- describe? All, <laughs> not quite all. Let's just say too much all and right. put the vinegar down. All right, yeah, yeah. I'm hopped up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm hopped up. I'm hopped up on uh, bitter and sour taste at the moment. So th- th- those may be reflected in the words that I speak. Um. It doesn't have to be that way. And Tudor Dixon showed us that yesterday, right? She got Donald Trump on her platform and used her her access to him, her relationship with him and her credibility with him to push him meaningfully on something that many of us have tried to push him on for the last couple of years, right? Yes. The last 12 hours or so, we have gotten another glimpse at, at a world that we would be better off living in. We just unfortunately have not been able to. And what's gone on over the last 12 to 14 hours is what this primary campaign would have largely looked like every day, except for the lawfare that was launched against the former president in March. And we've been denied this. When, when we were discussing post-election early this year, let's, let's put the alpha males in the room. Let's put them in the steel cage and let's let them fight. And the, and the beauty of this fight would be the, there really isn't an argument to not support Trump as nominee again, except for what happened with COVID. That doesn't mean everything he did was successful, 
But when you look at the larger, broader context of his presidency prior to March 16th, 2020, if you looked at looked at it broadly in totality, would that be considered a successful presidency? Yes. And that's why we all supported him for re-election in 2020, right? Yes. We all have some, all three of us have some, are somewhere on the spectrum of dubious of the 2020 election results, right? Yes. So therefore him running again would not be an anathema to us as a program, except we have a candidate in the race now. What, what is the core argument for Ron DeSantis as candidate? What, well, let me rephrase that. Candidate in this cycle, because what he was doing in Florida prior to COVID and after COVID would certainly have made him a candidate to consider heavily in future cycles, correct? Yes. The argument for him in this cycle is if Donald Trump's presidency essentially self-emulated on March 16th, 2020, but prior to that was holistically successful, whose tenure systemically elevated from March 16th, 2020 on. Ron DeSantis is. Correct. So this would be the ideal argument. Let's put him in there. Let's let's see if the young buck is ready to go. Maybe he's not. We did this show a lot, right? Yes. Prior to the lawfare, this was the show we did. Whenever this topic came up, December, January, February, this is, this is how we discuss this, right? Yes. We're just being consistent. Put him in the steel cage. Let's see what happens. Maybe the young buck ain't ready to step, ain't ready yet. He ain't ready to walk the aisle, Ric Flair. He ain't ready to, to, to beat the man to be the man. He's not ready for that, you know? And he's got a good thing going in Florida, and we'll let him incubate down there a few more years, and we'll see you again in the future, right? All right. Okay. Or maybe, he, or maybe he's David, and we're going to watch him take out an, an aging, raging King Saul, and we're all going to say, all right. Saul has slayed his thousands. David has slayed his tens of thousands. Pretty obvious now who the man of this moment is. Here's the gold watch for Donald Trump in the golf bags. Thank you. Head off into retirement. But we're moving on, and it's time for the choice. We've made the choice of a new generation. Right? If you go back and listen to our podcast prior to the lawfare, this was pretty much the stance and the analysis that we took on a daily basis, and we didn't care which one was which. Right? Right. Ultimately, hey, Generationally, we'd probably lean to DeSantis, but if he goes in there and gets run over by, if we have a if we have a sturdy debate on the issues that matter, the decisions that are fateful in the lives of every American, and we get that fight, and the guy that maybe we weren't leaning to going into it is not the guy that wins, so be it then, right? Right. We never got that though, did we? We did not. We did not. The last twelve to fourteen hours has been a taste of what we, what, what, we, what we have been robbed of by this lawfare. We've been denied this. And really, nobody's interest has been served. I mean, do Donald... Look at Trump's answers as a candidate. Are his answers on the, on the preeminent issues better than they were six months ago? No. No. They're not. They're not better off. And if he is the perceived front runner, therefore, it, are we better off because of that? No. No. How much time have we spent debating the daily failing record of this administration? Almost none of it. Because what has, what has occupied almost all the oxygen in the room? Do you stand with Trump? The lawfare, yeah. And how you come down on that one way or the other. This has not been constructive in any way, shape, or form. And see, that's what I think. If, if forget, the, forget the numbers themselves. Let's just go ahead and for the sake of argument, accept the premise that media polls that are notoriously inaccurate. But let's just say they're all pointing in one direction. Whether, whether the number's 40 or 28 or 17 or 35, let's just accept the overall narrative for just the sake of the argument and leave out the, the Hugo Chavez-like numbers they're quoting us, okay? Let's just leave that out. Let me tell you, this is the least amount of energy on the ground in Iowa I have ever seen. And I've been involved in every Iowa caucus since 1996. Next week, we're going to talk about a, a column by Selena Zito. We'll get more in-depth about this. But just as a preview, if you don't remember who she was, she did this for the New York Post, I believe, at the time. But back in 2016, she traveled a lot of flyover country, including Iowa. 
to warn the elites, hey, there are, your poll showing Hillary's 99% to win this aren't, aren't picking something up that's happening underneath the radar here, okay, on the ground. There is a strong flyover country um, tilt to Trump, and you're missing this. And you're not even talking to these people. And lo and behold, that's what we saw on election night, right? Mm -hmm. Well, she just did this tour again. And we'll get more in depth about this next week. We're going to spend an entire hour on this. This is just the trailer. She did that exact same tour last month for this cycle and wrote for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, which is the traditionally the right-leaning paper in Pittsburgh. And, and she wrote the exact article, but in reverse. She said, I, I have no, basically, I, I have no idea where this idea that people are like, my world ends if Donald Trump is not the nominee. I, I don't see it. In all the same places where people were expressing that level of connective tissue to him, in all the same places, most of the people here are actually checked out. And so you have to understand about polls, they're not just, you know, if you don't respond to a poll, that tells the pollster that the people that respond to me are the ones that are the most engaged and most likely to participate. Primaries in general are lower turnout elections than general elections. Even in a good general election year, we'll get barely over 50% voter turnout. Primaries, you're going to get like 30, 40% turnout. Caucuses are like 25%. The Iowa caucus is like 25% of registered Republicans in Iowa turnout. So let's say you have one faction that's like really hyped up. They're not that big, but they're like really hyped up and they're going all the way. And a bunch of other factions that are just numb, demoralized, tapped out, think it's rigged, doesn't matter. And they just aren't even caring right now. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you have that. And so all the other factions are not responding to pollsters, but the group that's the most energized is that's how you would get those kinds of margins because a pollster is going to measure. Oh, Okay, well, that group didn't respond. That group didn't respond. That must mean to turn out amongst that group will be down. And this group, if, if they're responding, they're the most likely to turn out. Polls do not just measure outcomes. They measure intensity. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And so if you have the 20 to 25 percent, Trump is my ride or die. I would choose Trump over my children. It's a bit of an embellishment, but you know where I'm going. If, if that's the group that responds because they're all hyped up. Now, I don't know why they didn't respond to Carrie, Carrie Lake's book. She has a massive social media following that dwarfs our own. There is no way that Daniel Horowitz and I should have sold more books than she did. And we sold way more books than she did. So I don't know what that means. Because, you know, Melania is not visible publicly at all. Who's the most high-profile woman in MAGA world? Carrie Lake. It's Carrie Lake. So, I mean, you would think she puts out a book, man, that's going to sell 50,000 books just... On the power of that, it, it didn't. It, it, it sold kick crickets. And so I'm mystified by that. That doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, if, my, if what I'm about to say is true, then you would also think that that would parlay into success for people that are tied into that very group of people I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, it didn't connect with Carrie Lake and, and her book. I don't know why. But anyway, if one group is like, I'm all in because they're going after my guy. And everybody else is like, I just, I'm so tired of this. I want to move on. And I feel, like, I feel like I'm tied up on railroad tracks and no one will rescue me. And I've moved on. And I'm not going to respond. I'm not even participating in the process. That is how you would get this sort of really inflated notion of a lead. Because one group is who's doing all the responding here. Does that make sense? Yes. And everybody else is just kind of demoralized and not even caring at this point. And so the question then comes down to, see, you're like Daniel and I were talking yesterday. You are afforded the luxury of not really caring right now because we're not voting right now, right? All right. We're not voting in Iowa for 130 days. 130 days from today is the Iowa caucuses. So nobody, and, 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 and by the way, if you're not in Iowa, if you're not one of the 180,000 people that will go vote in Iowa, you can still have the luxury of telling these national, I'm not interested, not responding. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So between, for the next 130 days, and really, if you make it like 150 days, because then you'll have about 200, 200 some odd thousand people in New Hampshire. If you're not one of like those four, 450,000 people in Iowa, New Hampshire, they're going to vote. And you are just sick of the whole thing and don't care. You are afforded the luxury of, 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 of doing that, of just tapping out and not actively engaging because no one's asking you to. The question will come down to when we get when we get down to brass tacks in the final weeks of Iowa and the final days of New Hampshire, how many of those people right now that are very disengaged and, 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 and demoralized will now that now that the time is coming for where the game where it's game week, how many will show up? And, and right now, I don't think there's any way of knowing that. 
But see, I, I think what you've seen the last 12 to 14 hours, a, a true prosecution of the issues, the issues that matter, issues that changed and altered and, and challenged every life in America, I think that absolutely would have generated more interest than what we are seeing right now. And we've been denied that. Now, my guess is Trump would have come out of the gates looking clumsily against these things. The, the question would have been if we had had weeks and months of this kind of a, of a prosecution of the issues, if whether iron would have sharpened iron or not, whether he would have, you know, adapted and said, OK, I'm going to have to have a little bit more self-awareness here and I'm just not going to get away with bloviating on this. We don't know the answer to that. The way things are going, we may never know the answer to that. But the conversation that's taken place over the last 12 to 14 hours, this is the primary we should have had and that we desperately needed. One that was ultimately going to be about the issues that were going to impact all of our lives. Instead, we've been denied that. I mean, we can't even get Donald Trump to speak to issues that are threatening his own supporters. I mean, this week, his own supporters were given a ridiculous Soviet-like sentencing from one of his own judges. I, I saw DeSantis talked about it on Newsmax last night. I don't believe Trump to this point. What is it? 12, 26 Eastern? I don't think he's mentioned it word one, one time yet. Well, Steve, he can't because if he talks about that issue, you know, he, that could incriminate him legally. There's probably truth to that. But did that, has that tro- stopped Donald Trump from attacking the prosecutors publicly in his own cases? No. No. So I guess it's totally okay to throw caution to the wind if, if he's addressing his own suffering, but your quiet is kept when it's time to address somebody else's, which frankly, you indirectly caused. I mean, were the, were the Proud Boys there because, and by the way, one of them that we're talking about from Florida wasn't even there, okay? But did the Proud Boys go to Washington, D.C. on January 6th just because it, it's nice in Washington this time of year? Were, were they there for, you know, um, and, 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 were they there for an herbivore convention? Uh, the 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 latest on N- the the latest on NGOs. No, no, they came because Trump beckoned them to come. That's why they were there, and it's disappointing because what we need more than anything right now is a true litigation of the issues that matter the most and are going to matter to us and impact our lives long after this whatever last gasp boomer election conjures up is over. We're still going to be wrestling with these issues. And we and our children and grandchildren will be the ones that will have to, uh, that will have to confront them. And we have been denied a hearing to determine who is truly ready to confront them on our behalf. Instead, we have been thwarted by ridiculous Soviet-style lawfare against Trump. <clears throat> which has also provided him the benefit of not having to talk about these issues and do what he does better than anything else, play victim. I'm, I'm so at a loss that issues are on the table in the news today. I don't even know what to do. Like, I've just been so conditioned we won't even get to talk about serious issues anymore. It's almost like surreal to me we should have had months of this this should have been going on all summer long you guys have any thoughts on that before we go on well uh that's as the people are as guilty of that as anybody else uh they are right many of them to be exhausted by the process, even the civic minded ones, the ones who, when you talk about voting, you know, they get a little, still get a little warm fuzzy in their heart. Um, but there's all kinds of people who are, don't understand how easily they are manipulated to feel that way by the process. Instead of it's a Republic. If you can keep it, you can always, like you started this whole conversation, Steve, it's a choice. It was, and it still is. We'll come back. We'll talk to FBI whistleblower Stephen Friend in a moment. Back here on the Steve Day Show. 
powered by our friends over at Bambi. When you're running a business, your employees can create a lot of interesting situations. Todd and Aaron do that for me on a daily basis. Sometimes good, interesting, sometimes bad. Um, and if you're running a small business, man, human resources issues can absolutely sink you. As well as the cost can sink you as well. Human resource managers can easily cost up to 80 grand a year. But with our friends over at Bambi, they can get you the help you need for just $99 per month. And it's month to month. You will not get locked in to a long-term deal. Available by phone, email, real-time chat. Your Bambi dedicated HR manager is there for you to handle all of your HR issues comprehensively, stem to stern, and again, for just 99 bucks a month. And it can be month to month. If you're in a season right now where, you know, you're in a seasonal business, but you need help, you just need help for a few months. Bambi can be there for you. Maybe you want to make it a long-term thing, but something may change in the future. Bambi can be there for you. Go to Bambi.com right now uh, and type in Steve Dace under podcast. When you sign up, it'll help you and the show. B-A-M-B-E-E, just like it sounds. B-A-M-B-E-E. Bambi.com. Bambi.com. Type in Steve Dace under podcast at Bambi.com. The name of the book, True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to suspended FBI whistleblower. And the author is somebody who's been on our show before. Uh, Stephen Friend is here with us. It is good to have you with us, Steve. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. So, Steve, we had you on a few months ago. And, I mean, you have a a powerful story of courage, of conviction. Can you just kind of give us the Reader's Digest version and reset that for our audience before we get to some of the issues of the day here in a few minutes? Well, I joined the FBI in 2014 and worked on uh, at Iowa, your home state, for the first seven years and got very familiar with being a criminal investigator at a federal level and then relocated to Florida. And then uh, after a short amount of time where I had expected to be working on child pornography and child exploitation cases was reassigned to the January 6 cases. And when I got my first uh, look at those, it was very apparent to me that the FBI is manipulating the stats for domestic terrorism to create this false narrative, and then also using some very aggressive means to bring the individuals into custody. And I said that as a SWAT guy, that we were sending SWAT to arrest somebody who had pledged to cooperate with us. And I I saw it as a potential Ruby Ridge or Waco scenario. So I brought my concerns forward last August, and uh, within 30 days, the FBI facilitated my suspension from duty. Hmm. And so you've decided to come forward and tell the truth about what you witnessed from the inside at obvious risk to yourself, of course. Yes, yes. I mean, I I sat home and then uh, the FBI refused to allow me any uh, sort of outside employment and uh, kind of put pen to paper, if you will, or my my fingers on a keyboard and just to uh, get my thoughts together. Uh, about my entire experience as a police officer, as an FBI agent, and then really what brought me to to come forward as a man and with my concerns about upholding my oath of office. And uh, put it down and documented a manuscript, did uh, contrary to what the Democrats uh, represented of me when I testified last May, I didn't get in advance, didn't make any money, so apparently I'm the world's worst grifter. Uh, Put that (laughs) out. uh, The FBI told me that they wanted significant portions of it redacted. Uh, to which I said, uh, no, I don't work for you anymore. So the full accounting of what my experience was as a whistleblower, my involvement with the Gretchen Whitmer case, and an actual transcription of a two-hour meeting that I had with senior executives where they tried to compel me to violate my oath of office is all in there for the reader. Let's talk about what's happening right now, since you are obviously a subject matter expert on January 6th. Let's, Let's start at the top. What do you think happened, actually happened? If, 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 we, if, 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 if you had to go under oath and testify to what you think is the, the high narrative, well, before we get into specific cases, the, 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 the meta narrative of the event of January 6th, what would you say? What would your answer be? I don't think that it's a perfect puzzle where all the pieces go together. I think it's more about everybody was sort of pulling their oars in the same direction. And as a result of that, you had some actual provocateurs professionally there that were driving that. You were There were informants that had infiltrated organizations that were, again, driving them to do things that those individuals were not predisposed to do. There were intelligence failures. And, and to me, the largest portion that's never been identified, uh, I sort of compare it to the Miracle on 34th Street movie, where they have the scene where all the letters Santa Claus are brought in to convince the judge. And I think that Donald Trump brought a lot of novice people to the political process, and they went there 
but they weren't uh, so cynical as, as somebody like you or me for the political process, and they wanted to exercise their First Amendment, walk through the people's house, assemble and redress their grievances, and express that with a million or two million strong to encourage the members to not certify the election without having done a real uh, audit of what happened. And as a result of that, they've been caught up in this dragnet where the FBI is trying to juke its stats and, and boost the domestic terrorism now narrative that it's put forth over the last three years. And uh, and there's there's definitely a uh, an absence of justice now. It's not uh, not what I signed up to do. So many people that were there sent me emails. And when Trump got done speaking, they just went home. Uh, they got they went back to their cars, their buses, you know, went back to their hotel rooms, flew home. And then, you know, people were literally on the bus or on a flight home. And they were like, what in the Sam Hill went on here? I didn't see any of this. I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't a part of this. Um, what would you estimate was the actual number of people that were engaged actively with law enforcement on January 6th compared to the, the size of that momentous crowd that day? I would say that it was in the high double digits, perhaps. And uh, even with that, you have to uh, throw in the, the fact that there's actual footage now that the Capitol Police were initiating uh, and, and sort of egging the crowd on in many of these situations. But it's just so difficult to say because of the volume of people were so there, were so crammed in like sardines that uh, you could have an incident happening 20 feet away from you and have a completely different perception of what was going on that day. To me, though, the contrast of what was happening outside versus what happened inside is very stark. And you would think that if there was any sort of planned insurrection, as opposed to just somebody running around with the Minnesota Vikings helmet, mm -hmm. uh, you would have seen that similar level of violence on the inside, which we didn't see. And if there was any violence, it was the other way, where you had Ashley Babbitt shot and killed. Would you describe it? Let me tell you how I see it analytically and tell me if you agree with my analysis and if you don't, where it could improve. I see this as a truthless event. That the, the truth of the event is not known because it is not actively being sought. We don't want to know it. We, we don't want to know things how a self-confessed Antifa member from Salt Lake City, Utah, can travel thousands of miles and just so happen to be in a perfect position to capture the murder and shooting of Ashley Babbitt and give us the video of the event that we all saw for the first time. I mean, the odds of making his way one sardine through all of those sardine cans. And I just happened to be right there to get the video of Ashley Babbitt being shot to death. The odds of that are astronomical. We don't want to know how many people were there that were truly either black pilled or black pillable to use a phrase, and therefore could be prodded by uh, feds that were looking for people to act out into acting out accordingly. We don't want to know the answer to that question. We don't want to know how many informants were there, how many feds were there. We don't want to know why security just let people in to walk in and grandmothers who didn't hurt anybody and walked in at the, uh, at the invitation of law enforcement are getting sentenced to three years in prison. Why people who weren't even at the event get sentenced to 20 years in prison. It, it's it seems as if we don't want to know the truth, but it's we want to use this event for a narrative and and therefore the truth is unattainable. We don't want to know why a president can go on trial, a former president can be put on trial as soon as March when many of his supporters have set have set in cells for going on two to three years now, still awaiting a court date, indefinite being indefinitely detained. It, it seems as if nobody truly wants to know what happened. Am I wrong? I think you're you're right, especially towards the tail end of your, your description there. You're presenting some very reasonable questions. You don't have to go down any sort of conspiracy theorist rabbit hole. You don't have to be a member of QAnon to have questions about what happened to the pipe bomber. Who is Ray Epps? Mm -hmm. Why did they clear the scene of Ashley Babbitt and, and say that uh, Officer Berg was clear of any sort of wrongdoing? There wasn't an actual uh, shooting investigation that's done by police in that case. What happened with the people that were obviously informants or undercovers who were interacting with law enforcement and they're captured on video changing their clothes? That, that's just a few things. And I think that the fact that nobody's been willing to answer those questions is, is very concerning, especially because you would hope that your natural allies who assumed power in the House, the Republican Party, now have access to this surveillance footage and have not followed through on that. So then you have to wonder, is it, is it a uniparty after all? And, and why are they withholding that? And finally, I'll say that I, I believe that January 6th could be best be described as this Rorschach test. 
So depending on where your political worldview is on, on where the country currently sits, I think you see a completely different representation. And there just isn't a objectively reasonable eyeball that's scanning it now. And the only way that we could even make that case is if we're as transparent as possible and make that information and make that video footage available to the public. It shouldn't be limited. Julie Kelly's done yeoman's work. She mm -hmm. deserves to be in that room as somebody like Steve Baker or Joe Hanneman. Those are the individuals that are in there. But it's just too much volume. That needs to be crowdsourced for people to present the honest case of what happened that day. Because again, it's it's not a perfect puzzle, but I do believe that there were oars pulling in the same direction. I'm glad you mentioned the footage. I want to make sure we talk about that before we let you go. That I saw earlier this week on Twitter, that kind of seemed to be a, a proverbial last straw for you. That it, I mean, we have watched McCarthy cave on everything since he became speaker, um, which is not a surprise if you watch the way he has performed in Congress prior to this moment, which is why several friends of mine uh, or, or people I know were attempting to stop him from being speaker earlier this year. And the one promise that he had been keeping uh, so far was at least piecemeal release of the January 6th footage. Uh, Julie Kelly came out, uh, a mutual friend of ours came out this week and said, uh, yeah, M McCarthy's capitulating on that. They're not going to release now the rest of the footage. That seemed to you to be kind of a proverbial last straw. Am I reading that correctly? I think from the extent that I'm going to be engaging with the federal level Republicans, I'm certainly going to be engaged at a local level. I'm, I live in Florida. I'm all about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Mm -hmm. I want to engage at the county level. I think that that's really the only way that we can pull back from the brink here. And I've, I, when I first contacted you, I said that the show's motto was one of the reasons I came forward. Let's find out. And then before that, it was, uh, it, well, this year it's stand. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, maybe early, but I, I'm going with a new motto for the end of 2023 and 2024. And, and that's no quarter. And I think that that needs to be held accountable for the, the Republicans who have not followed through on their promises. They haven't contacted me since I testified. So I, I, I feel what's the benign betrayed. innocent I, explanation for that. There isn't one. I don't there think isn't there's one. one and I certainly no. presented a lot of information to them that didn't find its way out in the in the open hearing that the American people were entitled to hear. And, and outside of January 6th, they're very concer significant concerns within the FBI, but they have not been addressed. And they have the opportunity through appropriations to maybe pare this back a little bit. And they don't just don't seem willing to do that. And similarly, I'll apply no quarter to the uh, my fellow or my former colleagues at the FBI. I'm done with the qualifier of the good men and women of the FBI. You know what is going on there on a daily basis. You see it in the news. And for you to idly stand by when we all receive the same training and went to the Holocaust Memorial, went to the MLK Memorial, and learned that it's incumbent on you to throw the flag if you see that sort of abuse going on. You cannot just follow orders. The narrative of Police Battalion 101, the banality of evil, is real. And, uh, and unfortunately, too few people have upheld their oath of office. That is very powerfully said, Steve. Before we let you go, I want you to take a final minute here, if you would. What is something that you think everybody in this audience needs to know about their government that because of, of what you did to serve it and then what it has done to you when you actually continued to try to serve it the way you were taught to, as you just said, by blowing the whistle on things that were immoral, that were unconstitutional, et cetera. What is something that you think our, everybody in our audience needs to actually know? Your federal government is populated by people that view their oath of office as no more than an iPhone user agreement. They click yes because they know that there's benefits behind it. They know there's a pretty cush lifestyle that's behind it. There are very few true believers. I sat in a meeting with executives and raised my concerns about the constitutionality, what we were, what we were doing, about my oath of office, about potential risks to the public safety. And they said to me, and no, did not parse their words, they said that I had an oath of office, but I really had a duty to the FBI. I needed to do what I was told. And I have to imagine that that sort of mentality is circulating around multiple agencies. So in order for us to, uh, to pull back from the brink here, I think that we're going to need to defang the FBI and all these other federal agencies as much as possible. And the Republicans in Congress have that opportunity now with this budget fight. They can actually make the FBI an unarmed agency, as I've been pushing on, if you're not going to defund it entirely, and, and allow and empower your local magistrate, your local sheriff to actually conduct the investigations that need to go on and keep the streets safe. So groupthink, from public servant to groupthink, basically. Steve, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just very, I, I admire men like you who stand uh, get his book, True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to Suspended FBI Whistleblower. God bless you, brother, and uh, we'll definitely have you back. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thoughts on that, uh, 
both in, uh, inspiring but sobering conversation. Inspiring that there are still men uh, in our midst, but sobering at the things that he had to say and that he had witnessed. And he gets it on so many levels. But bringing it back to the lesser magistrate, that's not just like FBI, cloak and dagger, 1% heroism right there. He keeps trying to, he says, we, you, there, locally, we're all the same, and this is where it needs to happen. This is where you take your country back. The, the federal government, even on its best days, was not meant to, to be your salvation we to, he he keeps basically quoting jack from lost we we have to go back mm -hmm. go home take care of your business there make the feds take notice that the people right where they live are not standing this for any longer they're not waiting for a savior in washington dc he's absolutely right on that front Todd, you channel the the line. I think it's what is it? Sean Connery's character. What are you prepared to do? Yeah. What are you prepared to? What are we prepared to risk? The dude risked his entire career, basically lost it. There's just too many people who are not willing to risk the shirt on their back. I would wager, not willing to risk the shirt on their back to do what needs to be done at a local level, where you have a lot more say, a lot more leverage. Ultimately, he's, he's right. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate, the authority close to home, is where this thing is going to turn around, if it turns around at all. Jesse Kelly's been beating that drum for years, my friend. So what are we prepared to risk? Are, are, we, are we ready to risk? Be still my beating heart. The lady in your neighborhood with purple hair calling you a bigot. Oh. Or showing up to your school board meeting and pestering them, or showing up to your city council meeting and pestering them. You might get called a bigot by the lady with blue hair. What are we willing to do? What are we prepared to risk? Come back, hour two, Theology Thursday. We'll lead it off right after this. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin. And all of you, if you'd like to let us know what you think about what we think, please do so by emailing the show, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. -E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, TikTok. Find me on Truth Social, at Real Steve Dace there. And then you can also, if you wouldn't mind, if you haven't yet done this, leave us a five-star review if you listen via the podcast and hit subscribe or follow so that it shows up in your podcast feed every new episode. Thank you to all of you podcast listeners that have done both of those things for us. Please keep them coming. They definitely help the program. I'm not sure how, but I am reliably informed by people who know how these things work that they do. If nothing else, it just makes us feel good. So we appreciate it for that reason alone. Coming up uh, at the bottom of the hour, we will play three non-political questions. Let's get to Theology Thursday, brought to you by My Patriot Supply. If it feels as if, you know, I was listening to a sports podcast this morning, working out, and a guy was talking about how he went to a popular fast food chain after a college football game to get something to eat, and he got a burger and a large fry, and it was $18, and it blew his mind. Just blew his mind. What is, what is even happening? What, what is even happening right now? Well, we're, let's go Brandoning. That's, that's what's happening. I mean, this is, this is managed de decay. This is on purpose. Managed decline. That's why make sure you are prepared just in case. Oh, that could never happen here. Happens again with our friends at My Patriot Supply. Save 25% off their three month emergency food kit. That's breakfast, lunch, dinner, even drinks and snacks. The full complement of the, of the 2,000 plus calories that you need each and every day. And they've got up to 16 different meals inside, so you can mix and match. Stays good for up to 25 years with the proper storage. 
Can't beat it. Free shipping as well. Gives you the peace of mind of knowing that you and your family are taken care of should it truly go down. Preparewithdace.com is where you want to go. Preparewithdace.com. Again, preparewithdace.com. 25% discount at preparewithdace.com. Let's get to Theology Thursday. We are continuing and winding down our study of Dr. Tony Evans's book, Kingdom Politics, Returning God to Government. And this has, I think, been a very fruitful and worthwhile conversation, gentlemen, overall. We have two chapters left to go. So this week is the penultimate chapter. For those of you that went to public school, penultimate means... Words. It's the second to last chapter. Okay. Uh, The title of this chapter is The Function of Kingdom Citizens. The Function of Kingdom Citizens. And I recognized I hogged too much of the airtime the last couple of weeks, even to the point of stealing poor Aaron's it's portion the of, the, Day of, the, show, bro. of the chapter he wanted to talk about. I know, but every now and then, I, I find that it helps my image to pretend like you guys are equals. Thanks. Can you guys pretend along? Do you mind? Sure. You're not good at pretending. <laughs> I'm not good at pretending. Steve Dace's spiritual just, gift is subtlety. Let's just be honest here. I empathize with the. Also, I, I empathize with the help. What's the chapter before this one? Because I think that's the chapter where the actually, conscience of kingdom that's citizens. Cha- that's what we're actually on. Are we yeah. on that chapter? Did I yes. skip ahead? Yeah. So you're bad at this at multiple levels. <laughs> nice. Very nice. I deserved every bit of that. Anyway, um, how's your resume? Let's get to it. <laughs> The conscience, we have three weeks left. Should I shoot him here? So apparently I don't know what penultimate means. <laughs> Highway underpasses are nice this, under, this time of year. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Can we start this again? Any chance? No? Let's Hillary, just, Hillary let's Clinton, just, where do, where's your reset button? Yes, I'm uh, just chilling in Cedar Rapids. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. The conscience of kingdom citizens. And since, Aaron, you got shortchanged last week, and I even took your talking point, I'm going to let you lead us off. Sure. So... The last two chapters, so this one in the last chapter, the voting of uh, Kingdom Citizens or whatever that name was, I mean, they, they're they basically two sides of the same coin. We're, we're talking about the same thing. Overall, I would say this chapter, I'll, I'll give Dr. Evans the, the maximum benefit of the doubt here. I thought it was a very pastoral way of confrontation. Uh, it was a very nice way of saying, uh, you got to reject the idolatry of this time. Hmm. And there's one passage, and it is a little lengthy, so bear with me, that I think encapsulates the message of this entire chapter, the conscience of, of kingdom citizens. Quote, Dr. Evans says, some people value policy over personality or character. Others value personal character over policy. Some desire expanded government, while others push for limited government. Some align more with the support of pro-life regulations, while others resonate with justice-based regulations. Whatever the case, one thing remains the same. We are instructed in scripture to remain true to what we believe. We are to honor our own conscience while trusting God with the ultimate decisions. Proverbs 16.33 puts it like this. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. This is a sobering scripture because all too often, it seems that we think we have more of a say than we do. We criticize others and talk like we have more of, the, more of a say than we do. But even through, even though humanity casts his or her lot, God decides how things will turn out. That's why it's so important to maintain biblical standards in our thoughts, hearts, speech, and participation in politics. Because unless you understand that this is a partnership with God himself, you can wind up making politics or even politicians an idol. You can even wind up using that idol to knock someone else who happens to disagree with you on the head. Politics have become so weaponized in our nation right now and throughout time that's often more effective as a tool for separation than a tool for progress. Dr. Evans' contention in this chapter is that wherever you stand politically, whatever your preferences are politically, if you're a kingdom of heaven, your job is to represent heaven regardless of where you are. He uses the analogy of, of giving a, uh, a chaplain service to the Buffalo Bills where his son played one Sunday. 
And then the opposing team the next Sunday <laughs> against the Buffalo Bills asked him to, uh, to, to give a little chapel service before that game. He's like, well, my preference is for obviously the team that my son plays on. But yes, they need the gospel as well. They need a word from the Lord as well. That's a really nice and polite way of saying we have, if we are kingdoms of heaven, we have to reject idolatry, no matter where it comes from. Now, the good news is, as idolatry increases on both sides of the political spectrum, it's easy to pick out when that idolatry becomes so apparent. It's easy to pick that out. The bad news when idolatry increases on both sides of the political spectrum the resistance to pointing out that idolatry increases as well. As I kind of said last week, when, when we were talking about voting, you will either be motivi motivated by your conscience or you will be captured by idolatry. I would contend as kingdom, as citizens of, of, his, of God's kingdom, it is our duty first and foremost, to, again, preach the gospel. But what that does is it pricks the conscience. It pricks the conscience. It's going to, we are going to face more resistance from our own side. And I'm seeing that already. I'm seeing that already. The godless right, the godless right, which I, I've seen evidence of already, is going to be... A, 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 as big or uh, uh, bigger than a, uh, of a resistance than the godless left because they're wearing our own jersey. But we have to reject the idolatry that's coming out of our own side as much as we reject the idolatry of the other side. And I thought this chapter did a great job of explaining that in a much more pastoral and uh, maybe nicer way of confronting that than, than maybe you're used to on, on this show. But again, that's the duty that we have. Reject that idolatry keep our conscience in the process. So you you just described a conversation I had on Twitter yesterday. And and I think I mean you made you made so many good points there one that I think needs to be drawn out. We will be more threatened by a godless right than a godless left. Because the godless right will say because we align on certain issues that matter, you should look the other way at at our poor character as opposed to calling us to holiness and to be better than that. And if you look through the gospels, what you see, I mean, if you, well, if you, t if you, if you look at the at, at first century Judaism, the Sanhedrin, and this would be an oversimplification, but the Sanhedrin was essentially made up of two religious political parties. The Sadducees would be the equivalent of today's Democrats. They had given up on a resurrection and therefore a judgment. They were worried about social justice and political matters of this world. The Pharisees were the ones that were still faithful to the way, to the law, teaching it, preaching it. Most of the, most of the confrontations over the meaning of scripture and, and whom Christ is that occurred in the gospels are Jesus versus Pharisees much more often than Jesus versus Sadducees. You don't really see a, a, a huge amount of confrontation between Jesus and Sadducees until he gets arrested. And the high priest that year, Caiaphas himself, is a Sadducee. And, and what does he say? Better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. That's a very pragmatic, worldly, political conversation. What the Pharisees wanted to know was, prove to us you're the Messiah. We're, prove to us you have the power to forgive sins. Where does the power of your healing come from? These are all doctrinal, ecclesiastical matters of grave importance. When he goes to before the trial of the Sadducee, Caiaphas, he's just like, politically, this has to, we have to, I mean, we've got a good thing going here with Rome. We're keeping the peace. We got a good thing going here, an acceptable amount of tyranny. This guy's got to go. The Pharisee who comes to us and says, abandon your Lord, because we're right on worldly issues will be much more of a threat in the time to come. Because it's easy to say no to the temptation. It, it, well, it's not easy. It's easier to say no to the temptation of the person who says, hey, if you don't mind, I'd just like to take your kid out of your home and castrate them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the Sadducee. 
or the Democrat. It's not as simple as, hey, man, if you look the other way, well, you know, I'm, I'm hitting it with a chick that's not my wife and uh, skimming money off the top of my business or my campaign. I'll help you stop that guy that wants to castrate your kids. What's the harder moral calculation to make? The latter. The latter. Because now your self-interest is involved, and it might even be a worthwhile self-interest at, at, at the same time. But, but ultimately, if you put your faith in ultimate, your ultimate faith in the word of the, per, of the godless person to help you stop godlessness as opposed to God, you are now a what? You're an idolater. That's what you are. You have made something else your God. And, and I'm just, I, I am bound and determined. And when I get bound and determined, man, I can get real stubborn. I am not losing my soul over the Trump era. I'm just not. And my inbox, because a lot of DeSantis people listen to my show, my inbox goes nuts when I say stuff like we said last hour. Prior to March 16th, 2020, I thought Trump holistically had a pretty good presidency. No, 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 no. I'm never doing that. I'm not, I'm not joining your race to the bottom. I think people get credit for the good things they do and the blame for the bad stuff they do. It's just that simple. I didn't say it was easy, but it's just that simple. So Trump gets credit for the overturning of Roe, which is the greatest culture war win of my lifetime, in my opinion. He gets the blame for his failure of leadership during COVID, which was the greatest failure of leadership in my lifetime, in my opinion. And, and what happened during COVID and Operation Warp Speed has created generational damage to the country that we're still suffering from. So I have a guy whose bio says he's a front page editor at Red State. Haven't heard that name in conservative media in a while, but it's, it's still around. And he comes at me and says, so you admit Trump did generational damage to the country, but you'd vote for him if he's the nominee anyway? I said, yeah, because I also pointed out he had the biggest generational win of my lifetime. What, what, what was a more singular life-saving event, Aaron, in your lifetime than the overturning of Roe versus Wade? There isn't one. There isn't one! So does that not count? Sure it counts. I think it should. What peace accord did more to stabilize a region known for instability and violence in your lifetime, Aaron, than the Abrahamic Accords? There isn't one. There isn't one. Not and you're 30 close. years old and a not dad. Even, not even close. Not even close. So you have to understand, east of Eden, this is very important. East of Eden, you are not going to get a lot of cut and dried choices. Well, Steve, it sounds like you're the one making the lesser of two evils argument. No, you've misunderstood my argument against the, mis the lesser of two evils. I've said this many times over the years. The lesser of two evils isn't an argument because everything is the lesser of two evils. Everything is. Everything is. It's a fallacy. So therefore, if the lesser of two evils is your, is your argument, then you have no, or your standard, you have no standard because there's, in a fallen world, who, who among us is not evil living right now? Who among us is not evil? None of us is not evil. So therefore, there's always going to be a lesser of two evils. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You'll excuse everything then. That's not a standard. It's a fallacy. The standard is you, you're in the world and not of it recognize that God will work through sinful people because there's only sinful people, yourself very much included. Sometimes great people, pious, holy people do stupid, immoral things. Sometimes um, immoral, decadent, wicked people do incredibly courageous things. That's the way of the world in which we live. The key is, and this is what Evans, Dr. Evans is saying in this chapter, the key is to not let yourself get debased in the process of observing and participating in this world. That's the key. That is the key. That you now don't say, well, when in Rome, do as the Romans. I can debase myself now. Well, this debased person did something good. That means I can be debased now. No, that's not what it means. Well, it's not fair. Um, it's, 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 I'll give you another one. It's not fair that, that um, pro-Trump people are demanding DeSantis do more to stand up for, un for unfairly treated January 6ers from his home state when they don't say anything about Trump saying nothing about any of the Jan 6ers. Now, that's true, right? That's true. That there, that's a double standard on their part, right? But does that double standard absolve Ron DeSantis from a responsibility no. to speak up for his constituents? No. 
If you say yes, if you say it's okay that Ron DeSantis says nothing about his constituents because Donald Trump said nothing, and, and then who have you turned the standard into? The man. Trump is the standard. And now you are a what? If Trump is your standard, what are you? An idolater. You're an idolater. In other words, you're exactly like the Trump apologist that you condemn. You're the same. You're just, you just flipped a coin. It's the same coin. You might be tails, they might be heads. You might be heads, they might be tails, but you flipped the same coin. Trump is not a standard. Trump is a man. The standard is the standard. And that means, yes, in this world, which doesn't want any standards and loves the devil, if you are willing to live by that, the standard, it will seem unfair to you very often. So what? Okay. So? Jesus said they did this to a green tree. What do you think they're going to do to you? You follow a Lord we murdered. At some point, consider things may not go well for you. They may seem unfair. They may seem unequal. That's the cost that you pay because of the cost Christ paid for you. That's the cost you pay. You endure a little unfairness. You endure a little persecution for the torture, mutilation, dismemberment, and murder that he endured for you. It seems like a somewhat fair trade. You get forever in paradise, provided you're willing to endure a little, if you're, you're willing to embrace a little bit of the suck in this life which is but a vapor. That's the trade. Seems like a pretty good trade. Just a lot of times we lose sight of the fact that that is the trade. Everything is the lesser of two evils. That's why it's not a standard. The question is, who does the most objection, objective good? Was overturning Roe versus Wade an objective good? Unquestionably. Well, Steve, don't you think any... Rep- no, I don't. I mean, did Roe versus Wade just, uh, was that just passed in 2015? No. No. It, it sat there for how many decades? Since you and I were born. Yeah. And, and was Donald Trump the first Republican president? No. No. We had how many others? Quite uh, a few. We have Nixon, Ford, Reagan, Bush, Bush. Did they overturn Roe versus Wade? They did not. They did not. In fact, the last real opportunity we had to overturn it Casey versus Pennsylvania, Sandra Day O'Connor was the person who screwed us on it. Who appointed her? Reagan. Reagan did. So no, I don't think any Republican that ran would have done it. Think Jeb Bush would have appointed the justices that overturned Roe versus Wade? No. No. That's a little bit like saying, well, I think if, if Dabo Sweeney or Lincoln Riley or, you know, Jim Harbaugh or Ryan Day coached Alabama for 10 years with all of Alabama's advantages, they won a bunch of national championships, too. That maybe I, I mean, that's possible. Right. But that's also a hypothetical who actually coached Alabama and won all the national championships. The guy who did the guy who did. So who should get the credit? Him. Him. Anything less than you're doing idolatry. All right, Todd, we're going to turn it over to you here in just a second. After we talk about our friends over at Relief Factor, if you're dealing with chronic pain, that's the achiness, stiffness, soreness, lingering, you know, suckiness in your joints that just won't go away chances are that's from too much inflammation in the body that's why you want to check out relief factor it is the drug-free pain reliever anti-inflammatory created by physicians who can prescribe drugs so you know you just want to make sure you know if, if there's a way to deal with something naturally do it as best for your body holistically now there's not always a way we live in a sinful world right we don't live forever in this form so there's not always a way to deal with things naturally Now, this may not work for you. There's about 30% odds that it won't. How do I know? Well, because over the years, about 70% of the people that have tried the three-week quick start for Relief Factor have seen such great results, they've stuck around long-term, which means 30% of people didn't. So we're not guaranteeing anything. But for 20 bucks, 
it's worth a shot to see if you don't see a difference in your pain level in three weeks or less when you go to relieffactor.com. Once more, that's relieffactor.com or just call them if that's easier. 800, the number four relief. 800 for relief or relieffactor.com. Todd. It's because of the power of what both of you said and that it stems from things that uh, Dr. Evans said that this this chapter actually was the most frustrating for me because nailing it so often but in, in other times particularly the message he kind of gives at the end takes away from it in my estimation because he talks about uh social media and how people in the name of christ are come across as unloving and it seems to be a toxic environment and he kind of throws out you know d- d- the conscience this g- this generic version of what a conscience is and you have to res- respect that and he you know he the democrat the republican things like that well it's it, that's kind of a like a 1980s conversation where I, my, the catholic faith is very clear in the and it starts off in the catechism of the catholic church talking about what conscience is and isn't and uh that the it, it's very important and dr evans agrees and alludes to this in having a rightly formed conscience well w- giving the impression at the end of this book that we just need to work on being nicer is it is troubling and punch pulling first of all he get he makes it a little unclear that and 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 scripture is very clear that we need to understand are we talking to the church or those outside the church because the message isn't always the same and if we're talking in the church he does allude to the fact of how fractured we are mm mm-hmm. mhm that's true. I've alluded to that on the show many, many times. The fact that we are not one is a gigantic problem. Now, when we get into specifics, that's a conversation for another uh, day. But no amount of niceness is just going to take care of that. No amount of niceness outside of uh, certain... Pl- you, you can throw out generically Democrat, Republican as if we don't see how those are manifested right here and now demonically and i have specific examples steve of how this recently came up with you and then our colleague matt walsh very recently uh but steve steve in you talking about idolatry and you did a long uh thread on that but somebody also and you you uh, responded to him i don't know if it was late last night or today but it's one of the first things i saw where a guy responded to you and said well when we talk about idolatry the scripture is pretty clear we're just supposed to be focusing on ourselves right so very self-help and he was like oh so well, we just got rid of the book of isaiah just the got prof- book of the book so of all jeremiah the prophets. See, all the, the prophets are gone that yeah. took you like two seconds like you didn't have to do you did mm-hmm. a really long hermeneutic steve and had mm-hmm. to get into no no look how obviously untrue that is mm-hmm. but that was a guy right there struggling to be like oh let Let's be nice. Now, if you want to say the Bible says to be more concerned about my own character than someone else's, that is true. But but that is not the same as saying to be only concerned about my own character. That's not the same thing. All right. That's why I said if you're that's why I I responded to him saying if your hermeneutic is exclusively true then we just got rid of all the prophets. It is true to put a higher estimate or higher esteem of your effort on your own character than someone else's. But it doesn't say to only do that. But that was just that was a weak oprah-esque response Mm -hmm. to what you were uh talking about and i just burn rips out and burns pages also matt walsh is now getting a lot of grief from the right for he was mean to the narcissistic 29 year old gal who intentionally got on social media attention seeking in in the name of uh destabilizing uh the family listen i Again, there's no amount of niceness, and the Lord Himself, and, and I, th- I, I just think Dr. Evans. I mean, there there were chapters at the beginning of this book that I was like, I was totally jiving with, and for the most part, with this book, I I, I just think this didn't serve the overall message because it absolutely gives an impression that somehow the problem in the church right now is that we aren't nice enough. That's the ridiculous 
thing that has been hamstringing us as a collective church for decades now. That's a fake gospel. Mm -hmm. that, is not, that is not love. Nicer than Jesus is not love. There's a time in love where you break things up. There is a time in love where you get nailed to a tree. And for all the good that Dr. Evans did in this, and you guys echoed it, then yeah, I, the end of this needs to be cleaned up because, quite frankly, social media is supposed... I wish it was more a rock fight at times. I wish, I wish it had been more effective. How many times have you had to talk about uh, David French sl uh, slandering the brethren? Mm -hmm. All right? It, because it, it people who are trying to step up and draw lines in the sand and get uncomfortable and saying that that's not the gospel and then david french gets like nicer th we even look, look these are the idols we're dealing with when even a man like tony evans and all the good he does in his broad ministry and in this book i think people are tired and i get it but no amount of niceness is going to solve the evil in this world. The evil in this world is counting on this niceness. That's a, that last line is the yep. key right there. there. There's no nice for someone that wants to castrate your kids. There's no nice for that. There, there's no nice for someone that wants to demand that you be injected with a poison. Or you don't buy or sell. There's no nice for that. And I... and And... Now we're lazy. We're lazy if we just go on social media and a lot of times, we, oh look, look at these la memes, laughing. St you're stupid. No, these. You get a, You should be calling them names. Don't call them stupid because they're not. They're devils. They're evil. They're wicked. Call them those names. We'd be lucky if they were just stupid. It's way worse than that. Call them what it is. Maybe, at least in the New Testament the most visibly radicalized member of the faith is John the Baptist. Yep, and he's the greatest prophet of them all. And Jesus said, no man born of women has ever been more blessed Amen. than he. Amen. You got it. Consider that. We'll come back. Three non-political questions will be next. Thank you. Vladimir Putin called the U.S. dollar's drop in dominance, quote, objective and irreversible during the recent uh, BRICS summit in South Africa as Brazil and Russia, India, China and South Africa formally agreed to use local currencies instead of the U.S. dollar. It's the first shoe to fall as demand for the dollar weakens. The buying power of the dollar weakens as well. That's why Birch Gold Group is busier than ever. Investors and savers looking to harness the power of physical gold held in a tax-sheltered IRA. If that's you, text Steve to 989-898 for your free info kit on gold from Birch Gold with thousands of happy customers and A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and countless five-star reviews. You can count on Birch Gold to help you navigate transitioning an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. Again, text Steve to 989-898 That's 989-898 Don't be a mark picking up what I'm laying down. Text Steve to 989-898 for your free info kit on gold. And now it is time for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. Indeed, it is time for three non-political questions, and we welcome in my oldest daughter. I was going to say soon to be mama, but you're already a mama. Yeah. I mean, the baby's alive. The baby's there. Kicking. You were telling us last night you felt it kicking last like, night. Like, I've been felt feeling like Felt her kicking last night now that we know for sure. Yes. <laughs> I've been feeling all the flutters and everything. And last night, I really wanted potato salad, like, very randomly. So, Stephen got some potato salad. And while I was eating it, like, all of a sudden, my stomach was, like, fluttering like crazy. It was, like, 
So she must really like potato salad. So. There you go, Aaron. Was it the Costco fully loaded potato salad? Oh, that's what you like, Aaron, right? That's what I was just thinking. Was it the Costco? They don't carry that anymore, though. No? Okay. It was the high V one. High V one. I think I inter- actually interrupted you and mom's like small group because I called her last night. Yes. Because yeah. I couldn't remember which kind that we ate. So yeah, I called. she thought it was you. And of course, you're pregnant. She's in a panic. Gets up, walks away. I'll be right back. It was just you asking about potato salad. Yes. And I knew she'd panic too. So I felt kind of That's bad. Right. But I was like, I need to know this. That's all right. It, it, she, you know, she, the, the, it, it's a joy to get to panic over these kinds of things. She looks forward to it. So don't worry about it. All right. What are we doing? Okay. So my first question for you guys is what is your number one piece of dating advice that you would give to like Gen Z aged people? No, this is maybe the hardest question we've ever gotten. Well, you want to go first? Yeah, don't, the, the modern version of movie dating or even the dating that you see is like destined for failure a minefield like don't if you don't dating without the end goal of marriage in mind and not like as some yeah institution 10 years from now but no like i there's no point in dating this person if that's not a part of the equation on any level you 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 don't know what you're doing You, you it doesn't mean like when you're 20 years old and marriage right now may seem like after college or three years away, th- th- that's all fine. But like you need to, if you're going out with this uh, woman or this man and it happens, you know, th- th- there's clearly something there that should be treasured and you just can't even because you've got to, we just got done talking in the past episode, that that's idolatry. You idolize something more than the relationship and god is fundamentally about relationship you are then you're engaged in something that is uh consumerism transactional you're more more worried about what you get from it selfishly than what we are getting from it from each other you there, you should not be dating at all at any age and i'm even like high school and i had this conversation with my daughters like this is not it, you, you, this is not just fun. This it's not isn't, a game. This isn't just a fling. It isn't just a game. It comes with consequences when you do it badly. So yes, even my daughters, when I uh, allowed them uh, to date, and for both of them it happened uh, in late in their sophomore year, they understood that, yeah, this is like, if I'm not impressed, you, you they will not be a part of your life. That's just how it goes. And you, you, you need to be part of somebody who you have high expectations for, and they have high expectations for you. Mm-hmm. That is so well said. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to try to top it. I'm just going to say I would, word. I'd be shocked just, if you didn't say the exact same thing or Aaron beforehand. Just to put a, put a finer point on that, I would say instead of expectations, standards. That's that's. That's what I that and that's the talk that Bella and I had early on in, in dating standards versus expectations. And I've, I've laid this out numerous times as well. Standards are what you have in your closed hand. First of all, do you love Jesus? Second of all, are we aligned in our goal of of what we're having? Assuming we've already had the conversation that we're doing this for marriage to see if if we can maybe one day marry each other. So we're talking about standards here. Do we have the same goals in terms of family? And then you can throw in same standards in terms of uh church how we live out our our christian walk so standards versus expectations just a quick practical thing i think for that generation as well make your dates you know assuming you've already gotten the 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 important things that todd just talked about squared away make them centered around walking okay you can't pull out your phone even in restaurants you're surrounded by tvs there's tons of distractions in restaurants most of our dates, when De- Bell and I were dating, we were walking places. It spurs, you got to get the blood pumping over a little bit. It spurs good conversation. And um, I think for, for that generation, that's probably, make it, walking is free and you can actually get to know each other pretty well. I think it fosters that. That's good stuff. I, I need to make one more point. It's really important because Steve, you've made it eloquently on other fronts before. Like, is your, is your faith ultimately about a... Uh, checking the boxes of a systematic theology or as a relationship now i don't go too far the i'm not saying like like be give them a pop quiz beforehand no like you, you see somebody 
tattoos up and down their arm, smoking cigarettes, uh, hasn't been to church. And if there's something in an interaction you have that is just kind of entrancing, we hit it off. Like we're kind of different. Go ahead. If you if, go on a date with them, but then be very honest about who you are and what your life is about, and see what it does to them. Maybe it does nothing. Maybe they reject it. So, but like, yeah, I don't want you to get the impression based on what I said. Take it very seriously, but also like be understanding that God may have plans for you and who you end up coupling with that you can't possibly imagine. You have got to be open to the power of grace. And it's not always, it doesn't, as hard as we work, it still doesn't always look like we thought it was going to. Question two brought to you by our friends at MD Hearing Aid, who I may be calling here soon. <laughs> <laughs> you should call <laughs> All right. Uh, hearing a loss affects millions, including this guy. Um, and had a chance to get my uh, stepdad, Jim, one of these MD hearing aids uh, this year. And he gave it uh, four stars. He might be hearing better than me, actually, right now. All right. So it's a fantastic product. They cost over 90% less than the clinical hearing aids that are out there. Um, and they recently cut their prices in half on top of that. So don't suffer in silence anymore. You don't have to go broke to be able to hear again. All right, take control of your hearing health and join thousands of others in choosing MD hearing aids. If you want MD hearing aids, smallest hearing aid ever, go to mdhearing.com and use promo code Steve to get their new buy one, get one for $149.99 each offer when you buy a pair. I mean, I, I had I had my ENT quote me a price for one hearing aid that was like three grand well here we're talking about two for 300 all right plus you'll get a free extra charging case for just our listeners uh, take advantage of this at mdhearing.com use the promo code steve mdhearing.com promo code steve question two question number two is if you could choose anyone to narrate your life who would you choose Don Knotts. <laughs> Why? That is so that'd obscure. Be, that'd be Why? hilarious. Who's the guy? The thirty-year-old going on eighty, narrated by Don Knotts. Come on now. Um. I would listen to Emily Blunt read a phone book. I just don't know that that's the greatest narrator for my life. John Facenda, but he's dead. Yeah, you can't pick somebody who's dead. You can't, can't pick somebody Don dead. Don Knotts is dead. Don Knotts is dead too, All right? No one who's dead. No one who's dead. I mean, I, I, I would be willing to watch a film about my life anyway, but if Emily Blunt was narrating it, that would make me even more willing. Um, how about... Um, Who's the guy that does this stuff for uh, Hard Knocks and the, a lot of the NFL stuff? Liv Schreiber, is that who it is? That sounds right. All right I'll go with him. Oh, does that? he really do that? I think he does a lot of it now. Yeah. Hmm. So I'll go with, if I can't have Emily Blunt do it, then I'll do Liv, Liv Schreiber. I'll go with that. Schreiber, I should say. Todd? Oh, uh, how about Sam Elliott? That's a good call, too. That's, that's better Just than my call, Cowboy actually. energy. Yeah. That's better than my call. Well, not better than my Emily Blunt call. It's better than my Liv Schreiber call. It's better than that. That was a good one. How about Gary Dolphin, the voice of the Hawkeyes? He's a good voice. I would just be cracking up all the time as he's, you know, mistaken. And How many things would he narrate in his life, in your life that would get him fired? Oh, well, yeah, a lot of things. Because they've tried to <laughs> fire that guy before for know, stupidity. Guy. Not on his part, but the people trying to get him fired have. So basically, Aaron wants the voice of the Hawkeyes, Gary Dolphin, to actually get fired and be unemployed by narrating his life. Can you see Gary Dolphin surviving a day narrating your takes on things? No, buddy boy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Good guy, though. Have you ever known him? And I did know him well in a past life. Good guy. All right, before we get to our third and final question, Pure Health Research wants, to be, wants you to be sure that you are worried uh, or at least aware of fatty liver because up to 100 million Americans are dealing with this right now, particularly as we get older. Uh, we throw a lot at our livers, one of the most important organs in the body, uh, from cholesterol to alcohol, toxins, statins, Tylenol, cigarettes. 
all right, over 500 key functions of your body are either governed by your liver or your liver is involved. So make sure you get their liver health formula. It's an all natural supplement contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that will help recharge and protect your liver manufactured right here in the U S and approved by American doctors. You can try the liver health formula and Receive a free bottle of nano-powered omega-3s to keep your heart healthy at the same time. Just go to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Again, getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Why do you want help? Because you have fatty liver, you're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those without it. That's why. Getliverhelp.com slash Steve and claim your free bonus gift too at getliverhelp.com slash Steve. All right, third and final question. Okay, my last question for you guys is if you could use Wonder Woman's lasso of truth on anyone in the world, who would you choose? And don't say Donald Trump because I feel like somebody's going to say that. That's exactly what I was going to say. But I feel like that was just too, a little too predictable because I thought of it. Anthony Fauci. Yeah, it's Fauci. Well, uh, since you, I mean, just just pick your garden variety teacher groomer. Let them rip on what they're really all Randy about. Randy Weingarten. Debbie Burks. Yeah. Uh, either way, but just prepared like for triple X horror. Vivek Ramaswamy. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm I don't kidding. would the lasso of truth even <laughs> work kidding. on him. <laughs> I'm kidding. That was a, okay. That's the greatest line ever. Would it work on him? He's the co- it's the Kobayashi Maru. And the lasso comes back. I got nothing. What's going on here? I, I <laughs> my my favorite take of this campaign is DeSantis needs to sound about uh, sound like Vivek Ramaswamy who has like no support in any of the early states. I love that take. That's my favorite one. And when I say that's my favorite one, it means it's the absolute worst take this entire cycle I've heard. That's what I mean. Aaron, whom would you, whom would you put it around? So, well, since you both picked Anthony Fauci, I'm going to say David Grush. He was that UFO, the UFO guy. whistleblower who testified in front of Congress. I like that call. Is this a PSYOP? Yes. I got to know. I got to know. Is this a psyop? Because yes. my boss keeps talking about this, and I just we need <laughs> we need an answer. Please help. I love that decision. I love that idea. I do. I mean, I love the idea of putting it around that guy. I mean, he said he has witnessed what I mean, dozens of actual files and reports on the issue. I yeah. like that call. That's a good one. I believe he's witnessed these reports. I mean, if you're writing them, right? Well, also, they, they gotta, you got to have some something in the file cabinet for all this stuff. I hear you. Let's, let's go back to uh, Vivek. How would that go? Wonder Woman comes out, puts the lasso of truth around him. What, what happens next? See, there are moments, we haven't seen a lot of them the last few months. There are moments where he does speak to the zeitgeist better than any other figure nationally this, on the but right. But you have no idea if he means it or not. He's and, just and, a really good speaker. And that's the thing. That's the thing. If, De, if, if DeSantis is kind of the, in the friend zone, I really like him, but I'm not, you know, sold that that's the guy I want to go home with yet kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Vivek is the opposite. He's the guy at the bar telling you everything you yeah. want to hear, no matter what the subject is, as the perfect answer. And so you're thinking what, sweetheart, as a woman in that situation about You that like guy. him, yeah. Yeah, but you're like, no one can be that right Mm -hmm. i mean if you talk to that same guy for two hours and he says the exact perfect thing on every every issue well he's like the type of person that you would go on a date with because he says all the right things and then like the second date you're like okay wait a second you know what i'm saying and then you start exactly what happened or your friends start to meet him and they're like uh that's exactly (laughs) what happened to him as a candidate he was out here first on tv more than anybody else and people are like, I, so so far, so good. They took him on a date. And they're like, oh, okay. So yeah. Alternate universe. Just to speak to what you're talking about. Alternate universe. Vivek has no dirt whatsoever. He's got a perfect record of writing, of, of, of his commentary. There's no flip-flopping whatsoever. Your opinion about the future of the country, given the package he comes in and the fact that he's a millennial, is what? Hmm. I would be greatly encouraged, but I just, I can't because I don't think he's genuine. If, if, if you asked me that question in February, I would have said I'd greatly encouraged. If you ask me that question today, I'm Carl Lewis singing the national anthem. 
Uh oh. I mean, I just, I, I, I don't know who he is. He has, he has, has no record. So I, I don't know if he's the guy that speaks eloquently to national identity or if he was the guy that, you know, was like, I wonder if you can get elected being the other candidate's groupie. I don't know. I don't know the answer. You know? Something tells me, though, he ain't going away for a while. So one way or the other, we're going to find out. Good to see you, sweetie. Good to see you, too. All right, we're going to stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers for the rest of you. We'll see you tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern, right after Glenn Beck, right here on Blaze TV, John 317.